Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China. There we go. Now the microphone's on. Uh, I'm the Freeman Chair here in China Studies here. Uh, my job is to offer about six seconds of emceeing and then <laughs> turn it over to my able colleague, Scott. Uh, just wanted a quick uh, um, sort of rollout that this is the second in our three-part series on Xi Jinping's Three Tough Battles, as uh, shown there by this uh, slide. Um, and we're very, very pleased and honored to have this um, fine group of people to come talk to us about the problem uh, on poverty alleviation. And please join us next week uh, for our third installment, which will be on financial risk, uh, where we have uh, Andrew Polk from uh, the Trivium newsletter uh, coming from Beijing to speak to us, and also uh, Jean Ma um, from uh, IAF coming to talk. And that'll be a very fascinating discussion. So with that, let me turn it over to Scott uh, to moderate today's session. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, and, and thank all of you for being here today uh, for this discussion on China's anti-poverty campaign. Uh, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm the deputy director of the Freeman Chair here in China Studies and uh, the director of our project on Chinese business and political economy. And um, the, our interest in rural China is, is not temporary. Uh, it's ongoing. And some of you may remember an event that we had last September with Scott Rosell from Stanford University who presented uh, some uh, startling data uh, on uh, rural China and, and human capital there. Um, and uh, who's got a forthcoming book called The Other China, which should be out hopefully soon. Uh, but this, uh, but uh, Xi Jinping uh, announced that he was going to focus on three campaigns, uh, one of which was fighting rural poverty. And so we believe uh, that there's a need to continue to focus on, on this topic. Uh, and we've got three fantastic experts to, to give us perspective on, on this challenge. Let me introduce each of them uh, and then uh, get on with the program. Um, so Kristen Looney, to my immediate right, is an assistant professor in the government department in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Her PhD is in political science from Harvard uh, from 2012. She's if you look at her website and, and, and talk to others, you know, she's done amazing research. She's uh, been awarded numerous grants uh, to support her work. Uh, she's published uh, in the China Quarterly and other high-profile journals. Uh, and she has a forthcoming book uh, that looks at rural modernization in China, uh, Taiwan, and Korea. Uh, at the far end is John Giles, who's lead economist at the World Bank. Uh, but more important than that, uh, he and I were classmates at, at SAIS in the late 80s, early 90s, which is where we first got to meet uh, and where, uh, from which he has blossomed. Uh, he has a PhD in economics uh, from Berkeley uh, and then was a professor at Michigan State. Uh, and he then he, uh, was there for seven or eight years and then joined uh, the World Bank in May 2007. So you're now, this, this month is your 11th anniversary uh, at the bank. Uh, he's an expert on labor and work, including the transition from agriculture to industry. Uh, from what I can tell, he, he appears to travel nonstop, uh, not just to China, and he was just in, in Hubei uh, very recently, uh, but he travels uh, to Asia, every corner of Asia and, and beyond. Uh, luckily, uh, an upcoming trip that he had in a couple days, I think, was postponed or canceled, so he's going to get to rest, he's going to get to do his laundry. Uh, is get to relax, uh, get back on U.S. Eastern time zone uh, for his body clock. Um, in the middle uh, uh, is Ann Thurston, who is a, a mentor and a friend. Uh, like John, also PhD from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, but in political science, not economics. Uh, I first uh, met Ann uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in 1991. And, uh, I was an intern working in another program, and Wilson Center always has these great scholars uh, who were there uh, writing. And uh, I was just, I, I couldn't believe uh, the, the luck that I had in, in meeting Anne, who at the time uh, was working on a small project about a, 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 a doctor who worked in China uh, who ended up writing, help, helping him write a book as the books The Private Life of Chairman Mao. Uh, about uh, Li Jiusui and his view of Mao and the leadership in uh, the 1960s and 70s. Um, and uh, we've uh, been in touch ever since. 
uh, Anne has wrote, written a lot before then, including Enemies of the People, uh, and, and most recently, uh, she uh, took on the task of helping the Dalai Lama's uh, second eldest brother tell his story, the noodle maker of Kal Kalimpong. Uh, and, and this is her, her specialty, is to help us uh, look at the world through the eyes of other people, but a particular type of folks who themselves are struggling with their perspective. And typically, they're not the, 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 the leaders of their societies. They're, they're the ones who are struggling to figure out where their societies ought to go. And those are the most difficult stories to tell. And Anne tells them better uh, than anyone. Uh, she spent many years in rural China and other parts of China. And uh, she's going to help us uh, get some perspective on, on, the, on rural China that uh, many of us just wouldn't be able to, to provide. So. Um, the, I wanted to, I'm going to initially just throw out a question, and then I'm going to ask uh, each of them a specific question. And I've, I've asked them all in preparation for today if they would find a few photos of rural China and, and bring them with them. Because uh, living in Washington, D.C., you kind of might forget what rural China looks like, what it feels like. Um, and so uh, to help us through this conversation, to make it a little bit more tangible, I asked if they, they would do that. So the, the first uh, slide I want to show, and I hopefully this is going to work, uh, is this one, which is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, not necessarily the best coverage of rural China from uh, the media, but nevertheless, they had this great slide from several years ago, which looks at rates of extreme poverty uh, in China and some other places. And the picture shows poverty in China uh, being reduced radically uh, as, and compared to elsewhere. So my, one of the questions that I'm motivated by, uh, it, which is, I think, a rhetorical question, is, well, what are we here talking about? Shouldn't we, is this a historical problem we're talking about? What's there to be worried about with regard to poverty in rural China that would lead Xi Jinping to say, let's make this one of our top three battles of the next few years? Anyway, so that's my uneducated Wall Street Journal thin cut at the big, big overarching question. So, uh, so what I've done, again, I asked them to, to bring some photos and to make some initial opening remarks. So we're going to turn to Kristen first. Uh, who has uh, done a lot of research in rural China, looking at governance, looking at reforms, policy reforms to address some of these challenges. And I'm just curious, based on your experience, uh, academic and traveling, uh, what are uh, the big sort of overarching sort of evolution of what's been the evolution of Chinese policy to address rural China, address poverty? Um, and, you know, is there any, what's new of late that, we ought to be paying attention to. Um, OK, thank you, Scott. It's really nice to be here. I think, is this on? It is. It is. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so the pictures that are up here um, were taken in southern Jiangxi province. And this is a tobacco farmer there. And in the distance is a village that has um, probably looked like that for the past 50 years. A lot of the homes were built pre 1949, so before the Communist Revolution. Um, and even though it's not a close-up, um, one thing to note is that they're made of mud brick um, and have recently been targeted for a housing renovation program um, because they have been the housing there has been labeled kind of dilapidated and dangerous housing. So I'll come back to housing in a second, but to directly address your question about kind of the broad policy overview, any discussion of poverty reduction in China has to start with the 1978 to 1984 period, which is the period during which poverty uh, was not only historically reached historic um, uh, success in China, but globally too. So within just about a five year period, 120 million people were lifted out of poverty. The incidence of poverty in China was cut in half 
Um, and there's different explanations for why this was the case. One is a technological explanation, which describes um, a green revolution that China experienced actually during the Mao era in the late 1970s. Um, this explanation says that our previous interpretation of socialist agriculture was incorrect and collective farms actually were good for spreading new technologies, seed varieties, building up irrigation infrastructure, et cetera. I think that's a minority perspective on why we had such amazing reduction of poverty in the reform era. The other more dominant, predominant view, which I think is more widely accepted, is a political institutional explanation. And that explanation focuses on Deng Xiaoping's leadership, um, along with other reformers, including economic planner Chen Yun, who beginning in December of 1978, at a very famous meeting uh, referred to as the Third Plenum, um, commonly initiated a series of reforms that included shifting government investment from heavy industry to light industry, um, increasing state procurement prices for grain and other farm products, um, encouraging agricultural specialization, which is different than the prior Maoist era, which um, had a grain first policy or slogan, um, encouraging agricultural specialization, and then eventually this kind of more permissive environment led to the dismantling of the people's communes and the establishment of the household contracting system, um, with a process commonly known as decollectivization in China. And decollectivization, um, many people believe was the most single most significant thing that happened in the story of poverty reduction in China. And arguably, this set of reforms is also responsible for China's economic takeoff, because what that did in creating small family farms is release a lot of surplus labor uh, that then went into other sectors of the economy. And um, the most important one in the 1980s being township and village enterprises. TVEs by the mid 1990s were responsible for about half of uh, GDP output and about half of exports and employment. So um, decollectivization, had that not happened, we might not see China's industrial takeoff. Um, so, uh, the debate of technology versus political institutional change aside, I think most scholars agree that after 1984, the story of rural China was not so positive. Um, the growth, annual growth rate in farming uh, dropped from about 10% a year to uh, more in line with global averages, um, you know, between 2 to 4% um, per year. And um, government investment in the countryside declined. Um, and we had a return to kind of the Mao era policy of uh, making the burden of social welfare provision um, local government responsibility. So central government investment was not really targeted towards the countryside. And because we no longer had people's communes or the collective system in the countryside, um, local government income in the countryside declined. And as a result, there was an overall deterioration in the provision of public goods and services. So just to give you a really uh, specific example, barefoot doctors, right? This group of people that was you know, famous for um, uh, causing the spread of preventative medicine um, under the, in the Mao era basically disappeared in the reform era because there was no money to fund it after the communes were dismantled. So according to many accounts, right, Yes, the reforms led to economic growth, but there was also this trade-off with certain development outcomes that rural public goods and services declined in terms of their quality. The 90s were a rough decade for farmers. So poverty continued to decline, mostly because of TVEs, though, not because of farming. And if you look at data on farm income, for example, it actually experienced kind of negative growth um, in the late 1990s. And this is because I think it is accurate to characterize the Jiang Zemin uh, regime in China as one that was committed to a policy of urban bias, right? Allocating the vast majority of resources to the urban industrial sector. So those reforms that Deng Xiaoping initiated in 1978 of directing investment towards light industry, for example, were reversed after um, the 1984 period and especially in, into the 1990s. And in the late 1990s, farm incomes actually experienced negative growth. Um, the central government recognizing that there was this growing regional inequality in China um, tried to centralize its fiscal authority in order to increase its redistributive capacity, meaning um, increase the ability to take money from rich provinces like Guangdong and deliver it to poorer provinces like Qinghai and Gansu. Um, and it was successful at doing that. However, um, these Fiscal reforms that occurred in the mid-1990s also had the unintentional effect of making local government finances worse, right? The central government now had more money. It was taking in more money. But that meant that local governments everywhere had less money, um, including in poorer uh, provinces, which 
I think unintentionally led to a further decline of um, the quality of local, uh, local goods and services in some of these rural areas. Um, central government tried to make up for that um, through transfers and Jiang Zemin, one thing that he did uh, do was launch this big Open the West campaign in the, late, in the late 1990s to try and create uh, development and growth opportunities in some of China's western provinces that were significantly less well off than the eastern coastal provinces. Um, but the overall story of farming in the late 1990s, again, was not a positive one. And faced with declining budgets, local governments resorted to the collection of excessive fees from peasants and also land grabs. This is when you really see land grabs and it's hard to call them illegal, but land expropriation occurring at higher incidence um, in the late 1990s. Um, Poverty counties was a designation that uh, was given to about 300 or so counties in the mid-1980s. They continued to receive special earmark from, funds from the central government. And actually, the number of poverty counties increased over time. Um, one of Xi Jinping's, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Xi Jinping in a second, but one of his main accomplishments uh, uh, as of late is to decrease the number of poverty counties, right? That this has historically not happened since this designation was first set in the 1980s. And he claims now under his leadership that it is happening. There are now fewer poverty counties in China. Um, but I would say that despite the designation of poverty counties and the Open the West campaign and other regional development initiatives that we saw under Jiang Zemin, the macro orientation of Chinese rural policy did not change until Hu Jintao. So under Hu Jintao, you do see rural policy change quite a bit. Whereas beforehand, I think the central government's kind of position vis-a-vis -vis the countryside was to extract resources from the countryside to fuel industrialization. The policy after Hu Jintao was really about trying to protect and subsidize rural areas. So this can be seen in the elimination of agricultural taxes, which took place in 2006, and also this other policy called building a new socialist countryside, which I've done a lot of research on, which was also unleashed um, or unveiled in 2006. So what did this mean? It meant that funding for rural development dramatically increased in the 2000s. Um, the income gap was not, the income gap between urban and rural areas was not necessarily narrowed during that time, but it held steady. It didn't get significantly wider um, because the government continued to invest in unprecedented amounts of money in the countryside, many of that in the form of subsidies, um, and tried a number of things to get the rural economy going again. Um, also rolled out a bunch of social welfare programs in, um, that made it possible, at least in terms of um, coverage or access, um, uh, the government can now claim that 100% of school-aged children have access to free compulsory education for nine years, and all rural families have access to health insurance, basic health insurance, through the new cooperative medical scheme. So these are some of the big accomplishments of the 2000s. Um, some problems were that while access to infrastructure was um, increased and it was mo infrastructure was modernized, the quality of services, and this is not surprising, going back to Scott Rizal's presentation last fall, the quality of services is highly variable. Um, the problem of rural land grabs got worse during this period. Um, and um, my own research shows that this kind of broad-based rural development initiative under Hu Jintao kind of collapsed into a housing policy, where rural development came to mean basically moving peasants into high rises. Okay, and that's kind of what my um, slides actually show. Um, so this is an unrenovated village. If you move to the next slide. Hopefully this will work. If we can move it. There we go. This is a, a basic renovated village, so not living in high rises yet. This is kind of what government intervention in mid 2000s, 2005, 2006 looked like. So you can see now the road is widened. Um, some of the houses have been kind of gussied up a bit, painted white and fortified. Um, but moving forward, right, you can see that the the quality, the 
quality is not the right word, but the type of housing that is being built is changing, right? So instead of just renovating existing housing, you now have this initiative to move farmers into what looks like suburban or, I mean, they claim it's Mediterranean villas, Chinese characteristics, <laughs> right? So you can see those kind of in the background. Um, so the, the, the house in the foreground is what all of the houses used to look like, right? And now gradually people are moving into these other ones. And then the final slide I have here, this is what a village looks like after um, government intervention, right? So this photo, I believe, was taken in 2013. Um, and so, you know, it's just so, it's such a world apart from the first slide that I showed you. And this is, when I say it's kind of collapsed into a housing policy, this is kind of what I observed in the implementation of the new socialist countryside. Um, Okay, so moving into the C era, that's all for my slides, but moving into the C era, I wanna say a few things about it and then, I'll, and then I'll wrap up. One is that the focus on housing is still there. So part of the anti-poverty, the war on poverty, Xi Jinping's war on poverty, is about relocating farmers from remote and rural villages where it's difficult to expand infrastructure into centralized housing units on the outskirts of townships or counties or cities. Um, along these lines, a related point is, is that the, the lines between rural development and urbanization have been blurred under Xi Jinping, right? So um, these development initiatives often mean turning farmers into urbanites um, and moving them into expanding cities. So that's the first point. Um, the second point I wanna make is that agricultural modernization um, has come to mean encouraging the growth of large-scale agribusinesses. This is a very difficult thing to accomplish in a smallholder economy and given the land tenure system in China, which I'm sure my colleagues can talk more about. Um, but that's what it's come to mean, right? And in some ways that's facilitated uh, even more land grabs as agribusinesses are given uh, encouraged to go into rural areas and consolidate the land holdings of small farmers. And the last thing I want to say about the targeted alleviation program is that, from my perspective, it's a really populist campaign with Xi Jinping at the center. Um, the propaganda involves many images of Xi himself, right? Um, which is a little bit different from the Hu Jintao era. New socialist countryside propaganda didn't have as many images of Hu Jintao, right? So C is really at the center of this. And the goal is to eliminate absolute poverty by 2020. It claims it's already lifted 66 million people out of poverty. Um, and they're using a targeted alleviation strategy or a uh, precision poverty reduction strategy, which is supposed to be um, tailored to individual households. So what we see now, which is very different from the past, is a huge mobilization on the part of the bureaucracy to collect data on individual households and then use that data to develop a plan to move people out of poverty. Um, there are various views of this, as you can imagine. The kind of sinister negative view of this is that this is a massive exercise in social control and it's so difficult that it will never work and relocating you know, farmers from remote areas to kind of centralized housing complexes on the outskirts of city is only gonna reproduce inequality within the city because they're still not gonna be well integrated uh, compared to the existing urban population. And in some cases, this faux urbanization is just about moving people into homes in places where there aren't really any jobs. Right? So I think this is kind of the negative, sinister view of Xi Jinping's war on poverty. But I think there's some positives too, right? And I'll, I'll just mention two of them. One is that in having a precision strategy that focuses on the individual household, the Chinese government is moving away from a one-size-fits-all policy approach, right? Which is, I think, a good thing. And it's something that has been a feature of policy implementation in China for a long time. Yes, there's local variation. There's always been local variation, but within uh, particular localities, it's often a one-size-fits-all approach, right? So this, for example, housing complex was upheld as a model in Beijing, uh, which is a city, the county-level city in southern Jiangxi, and this was the model that every village in Beijing was supposed to emulate, right? So it wasn't about creating 
um, a diverse set of villages um, that was tailored to the village's level of income and economic um, kind of makeup, right? But it was really about promulgating this one-size-fits-all approach. And I think the new poverty alleviation strategy is moving away from that. Um, and the other thing, and I'll close with this, that I think is positive about Xi Jinping's war on poverty um, is that by engaging individual households directly, the, 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 gov the central government in some ways is bypassing local governments that might be inclined to divert those funds to other purposes or to um, exaggerate the incidence of poverty in their county in order to continue to receive funds um, as a result of them having this poverty county designation. Um, so this is, this is a problem in the literature on development, right? Um, the, so the fact that there are fewer poverty counties now, five years since Xi Jinping took power, I think is kind of interesting and significant because you know the counties didn't want that designation removed, right? Um, but if there's some way to kind of link higher level officials with uh, farmers themselves and reduce the incidence of poverty, um, I think we'll see kind of less cases of local governments getting in the way and actually preventing uh, poverty alleviation from taking the, the, the effect that it could. Um, so I'll just close there. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. That gives us a broad overview of policy trajectory and, and big questions on the, on the table. I'm going to turn to Anne now uh, because um, one of the things that's important to, to know about uh, rural poverty in China that uh, is, that Anne can help us understand is rural rural poverty is it's not just simply about economics about uh, it's it's there's an ethnic dimension to to poverty there's a regional dimension to poverty because you know how large China is and coastal China where there's lots of rural folks this looks very different from uh, interior China um, and so Anne prepared some slides. Uh, and some comments to, to help us understand sort of the, the ethnic dimension of this. And as, in addition to that, there's the question of non-state sources of involvement and NGOs, and not just domestic NGOs, but international NGOs, including the kind that Anne herself has, has worked in. So if you could sort of help us, give us an overview of, from, from that perspective. Okay, great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Um, I'm glad to share some of my experiences um, from rural China with you. Um, I guess the background to this is that uh, in the, the winter of 2001-2002, I took a group of my SICE students to China, and they wanted to see uh, Western China. And among the places that they wanted to see in Western China was Qinghai province. And I went with my students. We visited a number of rural areas in Qinghai, and I fell in love with it. So I went back as soon as I could, which was that summer. And what ultimately happened is that I started something at SAIS that I called the Grassroots China Initiative. And for the first number of years, what I was doing was working in poor parts of Qinghai province with local NGOs um, doing what we call capacity building. But the picture that you see on the screen right now is a village in Qinghai province in Yushu Prefecture, um, which is about 850 kilometers from the capital of Xining in Qinghai. Yushu Prefecture is, was um, one of the poorest prefectures in China. At the time I first visited, the reported average per capita yearly income was $125. This village is on the outskirts of the largest city in Yushu Prefecture called Jiegu. And there are a couple of things that I would like you to note about this um, picture. First uh, is that you see, I'm not sure what you think you're seeing uh, in the foreground. But that is very typical of any Tibetan village, I should also say about Qinghai, about this Yushu prefecture, is that it's Tibetan, it's 98% Tibetan, probably the highest concentration of Tibetans anywhere in the world. Um, but what you're seeing here is uh, below you see what the Tibetans call mani stones. They're stones, natural stones that they take from the river and then they carve across the stone 
the Buddhist mantra, Omani Padme Hum. And it's a tradition in um, these Buddhist areas to um, every day, sometimes several times a day, circumambulate the Mani stones. Every village will have one. There are huge collections of these things, and they'll, people will be, be twirling their, their prayer wheels and circumambulating the Mani stones um, as an effort to get merit for, the, for their next life, to accumulate merit for the, for the next life. So it's a very, very important part um, of, the, of their religion and of their daily practice. Then the other thing I guess I would ask you to note is in the, in the back, what you see is lush green hills, um, some of which are cultivated, um, some not. But half of the population of Yushu Prefecture, at the time I started working there, was nomadic. So it was a combination of people living on the, land, on the grasslands and um, people who were, who were doing agriculture. Um, OK, let's, can we go to the second slide? OK. So uh, one of the things that, that Scott asked me to sort of talk about is what difference does it make that, uh, that to be an ethnic minority and to be poor? And what you're seeing here is something It's very, very close to the village that you just saw. And um, it's on the grounds of a slaughterhouse. And first of all, Tibetans don't believe in slaughtering their own animals, so um, the, to, the, the slaughterhouse is not Tibetan. And that's the sort of refuse pool where the um, refuse from the slaughter is put. But it's built out of money stones. Um, and you know, obviously, that wasn't something that the Tibetans <laughs> did. Uh, and it was something that was very disturbing to Tibetans. So you know, I think it's very difficult for us to conceive. We talk about discrimination, and we try to sort of quantify and understand it. But this is sort of you know, difficult, difficulties of day-to-day -day life in terms of somebody who has so little respect for or understanding for your religion. OK, next slide. Um, one of the policies that was being implemented in Qinghai province while I was working there was um, a policy of resettling the, nom the nomads. And um, my program was asked to come and visit one of the resettled areas and try to, um, try to see if there was anything we could do. So this is... The, a, the, a, 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 this is an area of, built for resettled nomads in Qinghai province. Um, it is located seven, seven kilometers south of the town of Guarmu. And if I could show you slides of the land from which the nomads came, and it is lush and green and rich, if you turn 365 degrees um, in here, you see absolutely not a blade of grass. I will say that there are two different responses to coming upon this place. Um, the, when I used to visit with a, with a Chinese taxi driver, the Chinese taxi drivers always thought, this is great, we've given the nomads a home. But people like me look at it and say, say oh my god, um, you know, what's happened here? So now if you show the next slide. Um, so the, how, what my involvement or my program's involvement became, we began, I, be, I was working with a number of NGOs in, in Qinghai, and I later was working with a number of NGOs throughout China. And the very first program that we did in Qinghai was to hold what is called an open space, a meeting of open space. Open space is a, um, I guess you can call it a procedure, some people call it a technology, where you bring people who have a problem together in the same room, you put everybody in a circle, 
you ask people who want to address the problem to stand up and address the problem and say what they think the most important problem is. That problem then gets written down on a big piece of white paper and placed along the wall. And you let this process go on for a while until you have X number of problems that people want to discuss on the wall. And then you have everybody break up into small groups and they together discuss these problems. Um, ultimately, what you do is you come, you, if you, you, want to, you want to know what the most important problems are. So if you have 16 pieces of paper with problems on the wall and you want to know what the top five problems are, you give everybody five little sticky balls and they go around and put the sticky balls on their problems. And then when you add it all up without any controversy, without any anger, without any competition, you, have, you, can, you can have a, a hierarchy of what people think their problem is. Um, so here what we are doing is we have brought this community of resettled nomads together in the same room to have an open space. Um, and needless to say, I think the, their, uh, their biggest problem was, uh, was how to make a living. That they, were, they, had, they made their living from, uh, from herding. And most of them, none of them spoke Chinese. 80% of them were illiterate. And then they were just put in this place that you just saw um, and really didn't know what to do. They were just having a terrible time making a living. Um, I will say that, that I think things did get better later. The local, the local government was very impressed by learning what these people thought their problems was, and there, there were ways to work together with the local government. Um, so I think if you went back now, you would see trees. You would also see probably a lot of people have returned to the grasslands. I think that's my last slide. Is that Terrific. My last slide? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can All right, we're going to turn now to John. You can hold on my slides until yes, after yes. I yeah, a you can. I'll let you do them, and you can just hit that button there when you're ready, and then we'll that way. We'll be fine. So the the question I wanted to ask for John, because since you, being with the World Bank, uh, you're, you're supposed to take the big picture, but you also go into the field a lot uh, and measure performance outcomes mm -hmm. and what works and what doesn't work, uh, what still needs to be done, and um, so. Um, Based on your experience, you know, um, and offering some comments on what you've heard already, uh, you know, h how uh, successful should we consider what China has done so far? What's contributed to it, and what are the what are the new things that you think China is is doing that could contribute even more to what they're doing? Okay, so I, what I think that um, Kristen touched on in her introduction here is that. There are really two dimensions uh, involved in, in poverty alleviation. One is the policy side, mm -hmm. and then and, and policy directly focused on poverty alleviation and reducing vulnerability to falling into poverty. And then second, supporting uh, the continued development of markets and uh, the ability of markets to help promote growth and, and allow rural China or rural China's migrants to help rural China grow out of, of poverty. So in the scheme of the 25, 26, 27 years since the early 1990s, I would argue that the biggest institutional change that has contributed to poverty alleviation is the ability of labor to migrate mm -hmm. out of rural China. Um, the, uh, the scale of remittances into rural China from, from migrants themselves and funds that are brought back uh, to rural China not only reduce um, poverty, but also inequality within rural communities. Um, the, uh, when we turn to um, 
I'm going to step back first to, to direct poverty policy. Uh, also, what I think Kristen noted correctly is the shift from emphasizing uh, assistance to poor areas to assistance to poor people. Um, and this is the introduction of, of uh, the Rural DBAL program, which was fully in place by 2009. It's, as with much of the social insurance system, we would call it aspirational. On paper, it looks like uh, Northern European or Scandinavian minimum guaranteed income program. Um, in practice, uh, the program is still highly decentralized. It's, the, there's an aspiration to linking it to your identity card and a unique number that everyone will carry around so that uh, direct transfers can be made. Um, there are only really experiments with this right now in Guangdong province. In fact, what, what still occurs is a, a really a community-based um, targeting system where the transfer of funds is in the, the is, is, remains decentralized, and different regions and counties have different fiscal constraints. So in a sense, there's not a common minimum guaranteed income, not even a common minimum guaranteed income if you spatially deflate for differences in consumption power across uh, counties. In fact, you, you have targeting uh, down at the village level, which is not always uh, which is, which is often uneven in whether or not people are covered. That said, um, uh, my colleagues who do study the impacts of the rural DBAL uh, find that it is, it is important in reducing poverty rates. The other, uh, the other uh, social insurance programs that are um, are new and prominent and also quite similar in the aspirational quality of them are the new rural collective medical system, which was phased in after 2004, and the new rural pension program, which uh, went national by 2012. You know, so for a long time, if you, if you were to go to rural China, my first trips in the mid-1990s, and you ask people what what they worry about, what is the, the greatest risk that they fear, uh, farmers would tell you that you know, one illness will right, wipe out our savings, a second illness could leave us poor and leave us dependent on, on family and communities. So the, the new rural collective medical system really aimed to reduce this, and it was rolled out nationally, but uh, covers really only at, at most 70, 75% of medical expenditures, if in fact you can find a doctor or if your, your local clinic or hospital has, has medical help there. And it doesn't, cover, um, it doesn't cover the gifts or presents you might need to give to doctors to bump yourself up on the queue. That's not insurable. Similarly, the rural pension program uh, has been quite successful in its rollout. Um, and for people who are ready of older age, they're able to draw a, a basic pension that's equal to about 25% uh, of the annual poverty rate. It's not enough really for you to retire on, but it, it ensures against a little bit of income risk in your lives. Um, and you know, mentioning the, the rural pension, um, you know, so the coming coming up with means of supporting elderly uh, who are still physically well, and even more uh, as they age and return re require some kind of care, uh, is currently very much on the the government's radar screen. Um, there are there's a recognition that much of rural China looks like a demographic donut hole. There are young people and there are older people, and a middle generation is out migrating. The old may watch mm -hmm. young children. Um, they also may still be engaged in agriculture, uh, and they face a potential risk of poverty and lack of care uh, in old age. 
Um, so if we think about, you know, Scott asked me to come up with pictures. I was recently uh, involved in a survey pretest in uh, parts of rural Hubei. And you know, so if we ask ourselves, like, what are some of the, the market supporting institutional changes that are currently taking place and have the prospect of potentially reducing poverty, one of them is uh, land certification. Um, which, um, you know, there are a, a lot of sort of institutional changes can support further development of markets. Um, land certification, where in this, you know, farmers have plots in most of the area where we were, they were uh, recontracted on 30 year leases in 1998. Um, but the boundaries of the plots aren't clear. And this matters as, as they try to promote and facilitate rental, transfer, uh, uh, use of land for collateral so that people can use it to get loans. Actually documenting where one plot begins and another plot ends is very, very important. So there's a process going on of using GPS technology and land survey teams to go out and, um, and, uh, and measure land. One reason why this might be important, if you wanted to promote commercialized agriculture that is uh, perhaps um, uh, more productive, you require convincing older farmers who aren't using the land that productively that they might want to lease or rent their land to an, an agent within the village or sometimes even someone who's come from outside the village to plant the crop. So to do that, you need to measure the land and re remunerate them for that land. So we're, we were taking photographs of these little uh, sort of land survey booklets that the farmers had. And this is an example of what a farmer's uh, land plots are. This particular farmer's, uh, Cheng Bao Di, has the highlighted black squares are this farmer's plots, and then they're blown up and, and written out here on, on the right. And you know, so all the farmers in several villages we went to would come out with their, their little books and their land surveys, and we were asking them questions about whether they were farming them or uh, someone else is farming them. And most of the farmers we met had kept one or two plots for themselves, but had uh, rented out or transferred. Some of this was simply swapping or transferring with a neighbor so that you could have contiguous plots rather than plots all over the village. Some of them had their land rented out to commercial activities. Now, one of the things that I found interesting, and whenever I can see basic economics at work, I get really excited. And, and I'm going to explain to you what I saw here. This was a, a document that an old village uh, accountant had put together um, where he had taken the record from the contract land size that farmers had at contracting in 1998 and had then, uh, you know, they wanted to compare the land from the initial contracts to the land area. Um, to the land area that was recorded when they carefully measured the land. And I'll, sh I'll show you here what, so in each of these, the, the, um, the figure in heavy black is what, what, which is a smaller number everywhere, was the estimated land area in 1998 for their plots. The number up in the right-hand corner is the number, is the size of the land area once it's measured using GPS technology and, and surveyors. And the interesting economic story here is that in 1998, farmers were still being taxed based on their land area. So you, it's kind of in your interest to have less land. And there were a lot of things being written in the late 90s, early 2000s about the terrible loss of agricultural land in China. Yeah. Um, after the agriculture <laughs> tax disappeared, 
And as farmers begin to recognize that their compensation, if land is taken from them, is going to be higher if they have more land, and if you measure it correctly, the number increases. So I just, I looked at this and immediately thought it was beautiful. So it's, it's this is an economist's sensibilities as opposed to yes. our, our other colleagues. So I think, shall I keep, um, I, I, there are other interesting institutional stories that came out of this, this trip. The other one that sort of um, merges technology and markets and return migration is that it, uh, there has been a lot of conversation about the potential value of e-commerce and um, whether return migrants bring anything to villages. Now, the scale of return migration is quite low, but in each of the villages we went to, we started asking questions about the use of technology for marketing. And in one village, we had, we had met a guy who'd moved back to the village who'd had some experience in Wuhan uh, running an internet cafe, took an Alibaba training course, moved back to the village, and there was a shift in production to Osmeth trees, or Guihua uh, trees. And um, it, basically the village was producing seedlings and then selling them through this internet platform to others around Hubei and beyond Hubei. It was, a, it, it was and, and the, the structure of production in the village changed with the introduction of technology. Presumably farmers and the internet entrepreneur were all making out well. Um, so in, in another village, uh, the whole village had, had expanded their fish ponds to sell uh, crayfish. And they were also s selling and marketing it directly to restaurants and others over the internet. So there are these interesting institutional changes, which uh, this is just what caught my eye, the careful study of whether this leads to higher incomes or greater inequality or reduced poverty is something for later, but it's out there for anyone to jump on Terrific. if you Terrific. have the opportunity. Okay. Fantastic, this is a great overview. And what, what I'm hearing uh, and tell me if I'm, I'm wrong, is we have a trans transformed rural China. Mm -hmm. right? We have uh, modern, inter integrated, connected, uh, where the center reaches out and touches every part of this place and is, uh, you know, Xi Jinping and Jack Ma may be leaving their imprint uh, on many parts of China that you never thought would be. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet uh, which is a big worry for folks here in the United States, but other places about automation, mm -hmm. right? And uh, applying machinery and, you know, um, we, we've talked about that in the United States about why we've had fewer people in manufacturing, but it also applies in rural China where agricultural work is highly labor intensive. Um, so what is the, I'm not asking just to, uh, you know, it, so it, should this be, a, is this broadly a story of uh, this modernization and integration into the rest of China and, and globally if you're connected by the internet? And what are the shadows, what are the challenges, the problems, the big worries um, about this? I mean, uh, Anne talked a little bit about uh, voice um, and issues of uh, you know, small scale local level citizenship but what are, what are the things that we ought to, that Xi Jinping ought to be thinking about that maybe he hasn't in fulfilling what looks like a, a grand vision uh, that makes 2018 rural China seem a lot different than 1918 rural China? And so e any of you are welcome to take on, that's my only follow-up question. I'm gonna then let everyone else uh, so take any little part of that you'd like or Um, I guess I'll just jump in and say that um, the government has articulated its vision of agricultural modernization as including um, not just larger scale agriculture, but more skilled farmers. And I think 
one of the big challenges um, in kind of moving from an image of peasant-based subsistence agriculture to fully commercialized, professionalized agriculture is training skills and making farming attractive. Um, attractive to people who otherwise, who up to this point have been choosing to leave farming altogether because it has not been profitable, right? So um, when you go to villages in rural China today, the vast majority of people who are there are over the age of 60 and under the age of five, really. Um, because ele even elementary school children um, <laughs> have, in some cases, relocated to townships or elsewhere for education. So it's a very old and a very young rural population that's still in villages. And so automation is important in terms of advancing agricultural modernization and making up for the, the decline in the supply of labor within villages. Um, but Chinese agriculture, I think, will continue to require not just intensive capital inputs, but also labor inputs because of changing consumer diets, for example. There is demand for organic products. Um, no matter how many advanced kind of farm machines you introduce, I think you know, rice cultivation and other orchard citrus cultivation, et cetera, will continue to require intensive labor, right? So I think a real challenge in kind of realizing this vision of a fully modernized, marketized agricultural sector is going to require thinking about how to keep people in farming um, because it's not been a very attractive option, right? People with education tend to leave it. Um, as opposed to stay in it, right? Um, so the, I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah. Actually, can I ask a question of my of Sure. Um, of course. So we said that I mentioned the sort of, uh, sort of addressed the question of voice. Mm -hmm. What happened to village elections? There was a time when people like me were studying village elections yeah. and seeing that they were a sort of hopeful, um, means of promoting some sort of grassroots mm -hmm. democracy, and they seem to have faded from the literature now. Yeah, I, there's still research being done on village elections, um, and but I think people's optimism faded a, a long time ago that it actually increased kind of voice um, within uh, village self-government, and there's actually a process of village amalgamation, so combining villages into smaller villages into larger villages, and one kind of um, downside of kind of um, centralizing villages, um, taking five smaller ones and turning them into one large one, is that um, it's unclear what happens to the previous set of village leaders or how power is now reconstituted and managed within these newly formed villages. So in these, um, in the Tibetan communities that you saw, I'm not sure if they are selecting their new leaders through the traditional mechanism of village elections or, or not. Um, so I think there is kind of this interesting question of, is the village committee going to remain a powerful, or, I mean, it was never very, is it going to remain a relevant organization as villages are reorganized? I think that that's an open question. I don't think the fundamental policy of there being village elections is going to change. I think that they will probably still be there, but um, what does that village committee represent? How embedded is it in the village community when you now have people coming from like five to 10 different villages who don't really know each other in these new communities? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm more sanguine. I think mm -hmm. that the size of villages in many places have really shrink down mm -hmm. and the ability to provide services and the ability to, there, there's, there's, they have limited budgets, they have, uh, very few people without migration of, of entire families and uh, combining v contiguous villages into, uh, mm -hmm. into a geographically larger administrative unit mm -hmm. and often not nominally larger than each one of the villages would have been 20 years ago mm. in population is not, is not a problem. It makes sense. Often the, the, the 
township level decision of when to combine villages arises when there has been mm -hmm. some kind of uh, uproar or complaint within a village with the current village leader or village party secretary who aren't doing their jobs very well. Mm -hmm. And the, the rational township decision is, okay, you need to be consolidated. Let's get rid of these guys. You can join with the next village. When the election cycle comes up in the, in the a year and a half or two years later, this group will be making decisions. Mm. So I, I, I'm, I'm more sanguine about this. Mm -hmm. And to Scott's question mm -hmm. on uh, technology and the, the sort of technical upgrading of production in China, in part, this is a reaction to the rising price of labor mm -hmm. that proceeded right through the global financial crisis yes. um, uh, in that it became more and more costly to hire labor. So the reaction is to uh, use investing capital and use more technically advanced uh, processes in export industries and other, other places. Um, the, the problem for existing migrants from rural China who, whose income rose considerably with uh, taking jobs that could be achieved with nine years of compulsory education is that it's not that easy to go back and get reskilled if you're 28 and you've left school. Um, there were concerns vo voiced about this in the, the sort of infrastructure investment boom in the uh, 2011, 2012 as well, uh, because rural kids were saying, hey, I could go work in construction. I don't need to stay in school. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is a concern that people have that even if you stay in cities, you have a class of urban born residents who ha increasingly have some tertiary edu education at percentages for the urban born that probably surpass the United States now for people who are in their, their 20s. Then you have living next to them the rural born with at most nine years of education, mm -hmm. with some exceptions of people who did test into university from rural areas. So you could have a concern that you know, even as you move the large, larger population into cities, you're, you have a built-in inequality between the urban born and the rural born. Um, and, and part of this may be exacerbated by the fact that the rural migrants who previously had very good uh, employment opportunities may, uh -huh. may or may not see these disappear with uh, in increasing skill content of work. Do uh -huh. mm. you want to add anything else? Okay, Unless terrific. I right. another question. Okay, all right. So we're, um, uh, why don't we uh, turn now to the audience and um, we've got enough on the table, but please add some more to it. If you'd identify yourself, uh, your institution, and keep your comment to a question, and feel free to identify who you want it to go to or uh, to everybody. So we'll start here in the fourth row. And if you can wait for the microphone, since we're live on the internet as well. Hi, Morten Testum, Center for Transatlantic Relations. Uh, my question goes out to either John or Kristen. I'm not entirely sure who would want to take it. Um, but with increased land consolidations of agricultural land in China, what effect will that have on the rural um, villages and on the cohesiveness of the larger regions uh, as these large consolidated areas are operated by fewer and fewer people? So population aging is a, a serious issue uh, for small-scale agriculture to remain uh -huh. uh, productive or to increase its productivity. Um, you know, the, the folks we talked to who'd rented out their land, were not, many of them were not physically capable of working uh -huh. on it. So if you have the young moving into the cities, the, the sort of rental transfer of land provides an additional financial resource for older people. I don't see that, you know, I don't see why it necessarily leads to less social cohesiveness 
as long as there are mechanisms in place for the land to be transferred in what are viewed as fair uh, and reasonable ways. I don't know. Um, I'll just, on this topic, I'll just share one perspective, which is not necessarily my personal perspective, but I think it's an important perspective to understand. Um, and it's usually advanced by leftists or neo-leftists, the new left in China, right? Which is that China's collective property rights are important because they protect farmers from their being dispossessed of their land. And that if it were not for the fact that they were that farmers were constitutionally guaranteed arable land, then we would see higher, even higher levels of landlessness in China. And so this is an argument against privatization of land rights. Um, and uh, there's really interesting work done by, I'm thinking of um, one of your grad school friends, uh, John Donaldson mm -hmm. and um, Chen Forrest Zhang, who are based in Singapore. They've done a lot of work on this. And they're looking at it from a political science and sociologist, sociological viewpoint. But they think that China's kind of unique system of collective land institutions is actually protected farmers from encroaching agricultural and industrial interests. Um, and um, that uh, in, 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 in confronting, or I don't know if confronting is the right word, but in interfacing with these agro-industrial firms that want their land for large-scale agriculture, um, the land institutions have kind of facilitated cohesiveness. Right? And um, given farmers a kind of collective voice that in a different system they might not have. So this is a very like, kind of contrary view to the... I don't, I, think it's, I don't think it's... I'm not talking about ending collective ownership of land, but allowing transfer of land, yeah, allowing of renter, land rental of land, mm -hmm. um, and sort of rules where people know what their land is is, is, is quite positive. Mm -hmm. What has changed since the 1990s, yeah. in the 1990s, access to land was still seen as an, the social safety net for rural areas. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, since the 2002 uh, contract law and land, the ability of village leaders to take land from some farmers who didn't seem to be using it and give it to other farmers right. to provide that guaranteed land that you talk about has been vastly eroded. There's, there, mm. there, you, we used to regularly see administrative reallocations of land yeah. with a village leader substituting for a market to provide land to landless people. Yeah. You don't actually see that any, so much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, one problem that arises and particularly may be worsened by this is that if your whole family is out of the village, mm -hmm. if there's no one working the land or holding it at the time that certification takes place, uh, you know, from the conversations we had, it seems like there's a good chance that with this process taking place, if you weren't there or have a, a, at least a relative in the village uh, marking out where your land is, is that it may simply not be there if you want to come back to the village. Mm. And we asked about you know, the sources of Jofen, I may, may not have the tones right on Jofen, on conflict. Mm -hmm. Conflict resolution. Jofen. Within the village. Um, and it was clear that one of the big sources of conflict that needed intermediation mm -hmm. was when uh, someone who had been outside the village came back and wanted land back. Very hard to get it now. Um, this is, yeah. it's, it's really changed with 2002, not yeah. recently. And it's, it's not a private versus collective thing. It's mm -hmm. just the strengthening of the actual contract. We're not on different pages. I told John Donaldson this directly, that I think he's overstated kind of the strength of collective land institutions and this constitutional guarantee. But I think it's a perspective that's out there and people should mm -hmm. Yeah, know I think about. there's, yeah, I mean, I've uh, talked yeah. to, to uh, John Unger at ANU, mm -hmm. has a very also similar view about yeah. things. I guess it comes down to your question, you know, your thought of what are the power relationships and can mm -hmm. rules and institutions protect villagers and including protect them from themselves? If they, mm -hmm. will, they make a, will they make a rational deal long term, not just rational deal short term? Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. go back here. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Sean Ling from uh, Syracuse. So based on World Bank standard, uh, the poverty line is $1.9 per day, mm -hmm. uh, which could probably translated to about uh, 4,200 renminbi 
Right, so China's own standard is actually 2,300 renminbi per annually. Uh -huh. So based on World Bank stand standard, do you have any uh, statistic like actual poverty line based on World Bank? And also in the cities, do you have a separate standard? Because in, in cities, uh -huh. probably even monthly 3,000 renminbi will be very poor living. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to... You know, so the, the, the actual details of poverty statistics end up being one of the more politically sensitive things that you can come up with for any country. Um, but, you know, so Scott put up a picture of the, the World Bank from a 2013 publication. His first slide gives the, um, the, the poverty rates based on the dollar ninety a day poverty line. Um, the, you know, where you draw a poverty line is, is in some sense arbitrary, and if it's the poverty line's lower, you have fewer poor people. But I, I actually believe that in China, people do report the World Bank poverty rate as well as the official government poverty rate, typically in, in different reports. Both of these are shown. Um, I do have, I could get into the weeds with you and discuss the details of how surveys are conducted and what I think of the positive and negative biases of that poverty line. But in the interest of other people in the room, it might be better for us to take it offline. And I'll tell you about it later. All right, we're going to come right here in the front, second row. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Si Xinzhou from Sakai Institute for International Studies and also a waiting fellow here. And uh, just now, uh, Kashin's uh, lecture gave me a lot of memories in my life. Uh, I'm six, uh, 46 years old, and especially during the, uh, when I was a child, uh, in, in dire poverty. But I still want to say, poverty is just a concept in comparative sense. And I think I'm still in poverty compared to the most a lot of people here, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. And uh, also, the, the, uh, uh, even in Guangdong province, there are a lot of people in poverty. Uh, even pro Guangdong province is a very rich p uh, uh, province in China. Mm -hmm. And also, I want to say, uh, China is also transitioning from agricultural country into uh, industrial country. And uh, when it is indus industrial country, that means it will compensate a lot to the rural areas. And also, I, I uh, at the very beginning, I'm a farmer or maybe peasants mm -hmm. in China because uh, we rent the land from the country, from the country. So sometimes we don't call ourselves farmers, but it's very difficult to get that kind of identity because it's very difficult. When you are not a farmer, you want to be back to be a farmer. So, and uh, you, you see, uh, you can get a lot of conversation from the country when, if you are a farmer, but if you are not a farmer, you cannot get that. And also I want to say, and uh, end poverty and also Another concept that means get rich, quite a difference. Uh, Anti-poverty, maybe by yourself or by others, that means by, by the, uh, the, 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 the country to compensate and also by the loans and by some other kind of means. Uh, this might remind me China's Belt and Road Initiative. Not only in China, especially in rural areas, but also in some other countries. But the situation is quite different. But the situation is very, very similar. So you can compare China's Belt and Road Initiative and also China's anti-poverty activities or campaigns in rural areas. And also, I think this is based on the confidence and also commitments between the parents and also the, um, the, the government. And because, because you can, can find the government must get the commitment and also should have confidence with the uh, farmers. Otherwise, they will not give the loans to the farmers. Mm -hmm. And also, the farmers should, uh, should believe in the government's commitments. So I think this is a, a kind of mutual confidence. 
between the government and the uh, uh, farmers. And the yeah, last one I want to say, why? Oh, the last one. The dynamics of the anti-poverty campaign, I think rural areas is a big market in China, very, very big. And if this market is opened up, and I think China, maybe it is just like uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy said, it is a kind of revolutionary poverty, uh, no, no poverty, policy in China. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Um, hey, can I see this, this the clicker for a second? I want to just ask about one thing, uh, too, because I had another question. But thank you for your your comment. I wanted to ask about what the about uh, the Huco system because mm -hmm. we didn't, actually it's one it's something we haven't talked about, yeah. and I'm surprised that we haven't talked about it. Um, so these are uh, people working in Shenzhen uh, who are rural Chinese who went to the city and look, looking very productive. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the place they live, mm -hmm. uh, which is very common. But uh, as you automate, as costs go up, um, you know, a lot of them have lost their jobs, especially as China's in some places not exporting the type of things they used to export that they don't have the skills, that the, their skills aren't required for now. Uh, but what we've seen in a lot of, in some places, uh, is, is that life for uh, rural Chinese who go to cities is quite can be uh, suddenly changed dramatically. This is Beijing in November last year uh, when Beijing decided that it was important to clean up the city and in a, a, just a couple days time evicted uh, mm -hmm. large swaths of their uh, population from the city's edges. Mm -hmm. um, so the hukou system uh, which creates sort of two classes of folks um, uh, rural and, uh, and uh, urban, um, what's, what's the, uh, is, is this a policy that should be uh, uh, eliminated? Beijing came out with a new set of policies recently that created a whole list of conditions. If you wanted to get a Beijing Hugo, that, 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 those list of conditions, you know, I, I've gone to school a long time and I couldn't figure out how to meet those conditions, let alone someone yeah. with less education. And maybe I just went to the wrong schools. But so what, what would, would it be too crazy, uh, counterproductive for China just to announce no more hukou? If you want to live someplace, go live someplace. It's a politically fraught announcement. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, well, so, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a large World Bank effort to produce what was called the Urbanization Report, or mm -hmm. recommendations um, related to uh, promoting urbanization in China and the, the benefits of it. And, you know, there are dimensions of the hukou. There are, there are places farmers can move now mm -hmm. and transfer to being mm -hmm. fully urban, but, it, but there is a point system for elite cities like, like Beijing and Shanghai. Yes. Now, one of, the, one of the sort of surprising dimensions of the resistance to simply ending the hukou system uh, came up with, it seemed to be the quotas for university entry. Mm -hmm. um, so on one hand, you have urban residents who don't want those migrant kids in school with their children. You know, officially, this is now allowed, and there are yes. uh, some parts of some schools in large urban areas with significant numbers of migrant residents. In other parts of cities, there are efforts to raise the cost of migrant children entering these schools. But on one hand, they don't want migrants in schools with their children because uh, they're maybe not smart enough. But what they really don't want is those migrant children uh, competing with their own children for college entry. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, these don't necessarily square. But that was uh, a, you know, the, the, the more surprising element of this. Um, so, you know, there are quotas in Beijing and Shanghai for uh, local resident children to enter local universities. Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of interesting dimensions of hukou reform also involves changing 
the system of uh, how you test okay. into and are eligible for university placement. Yeah. Well, let me just ask Anne, Anne, if you had a magic wand. HUCO system gone? Personally? Yes. Given my own background and values? Yes. <laughs> yes, I would have to. I mean, yeah, but it's, it would be very expensive. I would, I would like it gone. Of course expensive. I would like it gone. I just think it's, it's so unfair to divide people on the basis of urban versus rural. Um, but I understand it would be a huge problem administratively and financially mm -hmm. for local governments. Well, in other ways, in other in other ways, it's actually quite positive for local government and for local oh, economies. For all, the, all of the money people, they make from well, if people can, if people, if 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 rural farmers, if migrants can plan on spending their entire lives in a city, rather than expecting to return home, they will uh, voluntarily contribute and participate in. Uh, social insurance programs. So the uh, urban employee uh, ins pension and health insurance programs, um, there's a, these are, uh, will financially do much better if uh, migrants choose to participate. One of the things that we see now is that the employers of migrants who are mandated by law to provide contributions on behalf of uh, migrants tend to collude with them and offer salaries that uh, don't include social insurance contributions for either the migrant or the worker. Um, and this is a good and a reasonable deal because you don't know if you're going to be in the city to collect on this investment down the road. So you'd rather just want the money now. You know, so the social insurance funds within cities will do much better if migrants can expect to be there. If you don't have migrants who need to, re need to return home in their mid-40s to care for elderly parents, they will set down roots and they will plan to, to spend their lives there if their parents can join them in the city. So you, your, your floating population problem, yeah, you'll have more people in the city, but you may also have, uh, you may not have as much upward pressure on wages because more people will stay longer in the city. So I, I actually think it's, it's not a, a, a losing proposition financially to eliminate the HUCO system. I think the mm -hmm. problem and the opposition to it come from other quarters. Okay. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, Kathy Cosman, one quick question. How much of this uh, consolidation of villages in particular, uh, and perhaps the rural poverty pro program in general, has to do with homogenizing the population? I recently was told that only 10% of the Chinese population are ethnic Chinese. That fact may be wrong, but I just learned That's that opposite. a few hours yeah. ago. I'm sorry. I think it's actually the opposite. It's, you know, over 90% of the population is ethnically Chinese is Han, and then like 8% or so is ethnic minority. Um, and if you feel comfortable answering this, I mean, I think I'll just say that, you know, in. Um, It, some more critical articles, for example, of like post-earthquake reconstruction in Sichuan um, have emphasized how um, the consolidation of rural housing and government-initiated relocation of villagers um, has led to, in the, in the post-earthquake world, post-2008, um, has facilitated a homogenization process. Um, and I've also seen that argument made about resettlement programs in Tibet, too. Um, it's not something I'm completely familiar with. But I, I do know more critical scholars are kind of linking those goals together. So I would say my experience with in Tibetan areas of China is that this resettlement is not at all. Uh, hmm. uh, it doesn't help homogenization, homogenization at all when you take 
a group of people and put them outside the city and make it difficult for them to get to the city. They live in very isolated, separate communities. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is, this is a question of ethnicity, I think. It's not, I don't know how it would work for Han Chinese, um, mm -hmm. but I I'm certainly haven't seen that with respect to the Tibetans. Uh, to just be more specific, so there were certain like Qiang villages and other minority groups in Sichuan that had elementary schools that conducted primary school education in the, uh, eth the ethnic minorities language, right? And in the kind of post-earthquake world where those schools have been reconstructed and villages have been combined, um, elementary schools no longer conduct uh, instruction in the ethnic minorities language, but rather in um, standard Mandarin and Han Chinese, right? So that's just kind of to be more specific about what I'm talking about, about how it might be homogenized. But I, I understand what you're saying too, which is like, if it's all Tibetans that are just kind of being like put together in this one settlement that's actually quite removed from other Han Chinese, then it's not gonna advance those goals. I could, uh, just a footnote though, um, right. because the place that I used to work, um, Jiegu, Yushu Prefecture, also had a big earthquake. And um, I do know that after the earthquake, a number of the, uh, of the children were sent to other parts of China mm -hmm. to study mm -hmm. um, against the objections of their parents, I think. Mm -hmm. And the parents, of course, were worried that their children would come back having lost their language and their culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, I've learned a lot. This is an area I don't work on as much as I should, but I really appreciate the guidance uh, that the three of you have provided. Um, I mean, I come away taking uh, a, a lesson that, or rural China has changed unbelievably, and the way the government and the party have tried to address its problems have also been evolving in ways uh, big and small. There's some things, though, that they still uh, haven't done, which may down the road, uh, you know, more directly addressing property rights head on, uh, HUCO, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe other issues about how social stratification is, cr is created mm -hmm. in China and, and voice. But nevertheless, even having not, even with those things still not fully engaged head on, um, rural China is changing uh, and it's changing China as well. And um, it's, you're not going to just see that change just on a graph of a line going in one direction. Right. It's actually a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot to learn. So we're going to be looking forward to your book Thank you. coming out soon, the, the future work that, that John is doing and, and everything that Anne is doing as well. Uh, thank you all for contributing your questions and comments today. Please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you.